I'm currently an editor with Orbit, and we publish science fiction and fantasy books. Um, I think we're going to start off with having our authors read a little bit from their books, and I guess we'll just go from right to left. So we start with Anna North, whose first novel, America Pacifica, was out earlier this year. Hi, thanks. Um, so I am just going to read from the very beginning of American Pacifica. Um, I don't think you need to know too much for this, um, but I was told I should tell you a little uh, by the confused people. Um, it's, uh, it is set on the island of America Pacifica. Um, it's set in the year 2083, um, and there's been a second ice age that has destroyed much of North America. Um, I think that might help. All right. Um, the trouble started when the woman with the shaking hands came to the apartment. Her face was small but fleshy, with a little puffy mouth. She was dressed in shabby, slightly strange clothes, a magenta skirt a little too short for her age, a t-shirt with home-stenciled snowflakes, and her skin was a weird sallow color like she just fainted or was just about to faint. She said she was a friend of Darcy's mother, but Darcy's mother didn't have friends. You're all I need, Sarah would say, as she combed the knots out of Darcy's hair. Darcy didn't like the woman's hands. The rest of her was long and skinny, but those hands were so plump they were almost knuckleless, and they quivered like dreaming dogs. The hardcore solvent heads shook like that, but this woman's pupils were normal, and she didn't smell like a huffer or twitch and scratch like a snorter. If she wasn't high, she was sick or scared, and they didn't need any extra illness or worry. Darcy started to say that her mother was out and would be out for a while, but then Sarah came down the hall from the bathroom, carrying their toothbrush and looking at the woman the way you look at someone you've been expecting to see. She had changed out of her wet diving suit and into an old sea fiber jumpsuit with holes in the knees. She was little and hard, like a knife. The woman's shaky hands were opening and closing. Darcy, her mother said, in a voice that sounded like it came from a time before all the tenderness and bitterness and songs and rhymes and whispers and private names that had grown between them in the 18 years of Darcy's life. Can you give us a minute? Darcy didn't like it. The woman's eyes were moving all over the hallway like they were expecting something to come charging through the wall. What's this about, Darcy asked. The woman looked at Darcy's mother, and Darcy's mother looked at Darcy with an expression she had seen on the other mothers, but almost never on her own, an expression that said, please do this and don't ask me why. Darcy obeyed. She left the apartment, and the woman walked in. They shut the door, and Darcy was alone in the hallway. A wad of underwear lay against the far wall. She walked toward it so they would hear her footsteps. Then she tiptoed back. She knelt by the door of the apartment and pressed her ear against it. The door was made of cheap seaboard. It smelled like the dirty ocean after a long rain, and if you scratched it, it flaked away under your fingernails. Through it, she could make out the woman's whispers, like dishwater swishing in a tub. I sh your note, the woman was saying. I never sh it would happen again. I wasn't ready. Will you go, her mother said? I sh but I just can't do it. Darcy tried to hear the emotion in her mother's voice, but she was still speaking strangely, as though all along her voice had contained another voice, and she was just now unwrapping it. I'll talk to sh the woman said. We're going to need money, though. Then her voice went so low that Darcy couldn't hear it. Darcy pulled her necklace up around her chin and tucked the charm into her mouth, an old nervous habit. The charm was silver, a small, scaly bullet shape that her mother had explained was called a pine cone. Darcy had found it folded into Sarah's oldest, most threadbare shirt when she was doing laundry by herself for the first time five or six years ago. All Sarah would say was that it belonged to Darcy's mother and that pine cones grew on trees on the mainland. So next we have Kathleen Ann Goodman, whose most recent novel is uh, This Year's Dream. Uh, it was published by Four earlier this year. Hi. I'm going to read from the very beginning of This Year's Dream, which is conveniently only about two pages. And um, <laughs> this is a, uh, a character who is in uh, my previous book, even more times, but it goes back before that time. Um, Eliane Haddon's Time Stream 1, July 1890, north of St. Petersburg, Russia. Years afterwards, Eliane realized that the meadow and the small country daca belonged to her St. Petersburg grandmother. It was directly on the shore of a cold, clear lake. On this summer morning, Eliani, five years old, in her second story bedroom, struggled to button her dress. She was eager to join her mother, Rosa, who was framed by the dormer window and limbed by sunlight as she stood below on the weathered dock. Hands on her hips, Rosa gazed outward, her cotton skirt fluttering in the slight breeze. She turned, saw Eliani, and waved, come down. 
As Eliane grew, so did her awareness of her mother's uniqueness. Rosa Haddens was a medical doctor in an age when very few women were and was therefore quite naturally a feminist. She was also a poet and a pacifist. But now, Rosa Haddens was just her mother out by the lake. Eliani gave up on the rest of her buttons. She ran down the stairs to the house, ignoring the maids shouted, slow down, and pounded onto the dock. Be careful of that rotten board, her mother said. She looked back at the house and sighed. The old house used to be so beautiful, not so shabby. When I was a little girl visiting my cousins, it was paradise, white crystal, linen, and laughter. Eliani, used to the looming streets of Vienna, breathed the spice of fir trees and the scent of fresh, clean water. Beyond the meadow, where blue cornflowers swept through tall grass, lay a mysterious sun-dappled forest driven by an arrow straight road that they followed from train station to carriage house in her grandmother's Tarantas, pulled by four black horses. She saw nothing but vast, open, intense paradise. Below, golden, wave-scalloped sand shimmered through water clear as glass. Can we swim? Rosa smiled down at Eliani, her eyes shadowed by wings of loose, shining black hair. It's cold, she warned, and you don't know how. It's easy, though. To Eliani's surprise, her mother began unbuttoning the long row of buttons on her dress. She shrugged it off, along with the complicated cotton undergarment she wore, stooping finally to unlace her low black boots and kick them off. Then she stood on the dock, naked. Eliani was astonished. Her mother's quintessential, quintessential space was a dressing room, draped with clothing, which she donned with care and precision. Eliani had once or twice glimpsed her mother naked, but never like this, never boldly out in the sunlight, framed by forest and green hills. Well, Rosa threw back her head and laughed, not just to her daughter, but also to the lake, the forest, the intense blue sky. She dashed to the end of the dock, dove in and surfaced, shrieking and breathless. Come on, then. Eliana undid her just-fastened buttons quickly. The air and the sunlight felt good on her bare skin. She stood on the edge of the dock, hesitated, then jumped. She plummeted down, shocked by the cold, then saw through the water her mother's pale, blurred body move toward her. Her mother caught and boosted her to the surface. Move your arms, Rosa said calmly as Eliana sputtered and coughed and felt a peculiar tang in her nose. Kick your legs. That's swimming. Good, I'm right here. Eliani no longer felt the cold, only the cool, unfettered liquid, a new silken atmosphere. The sun, in contrast, was hot on her back. It was delicious. Her mother's deft hands turned her over so that she squinted at the brilliance and glimpsed the ring of pointed furs surrounding the circle of blue sky. Take a deep breath. The air in your lungs is lighter than the water. Relax, you'll float. Her father's violin music suddenly pierced the air and seemed a part of the forest, the lake, and the house, where he practiced every morning in the parlor. Eliani looked up at the summer sky, cloudless and intense. She took a deep breath and floated. Thank you. And uh, lastly, we have Charles Yu reading from uh, How to Live Safely in a Science Fiction Universe. Thanks. Hi. So I guess uh, to set it up, Charles Yu, the protagonist of this novel, is in a place called Minor Universe 31, which is a slightly damaged universe. And his job is he's a time machine repairman. Um, I'm going to read the last two pages of the novel, just to spoil it for everybody. <laughs> I'm going to read the first. I'm going to read the beginning, I guess. <laughs> okay. There is just enough space inside here for one person to live indefinitely. Or at least that's what the operation manual says. User can survive inside the TM31 recreational time travel device in isolation for an indefinite period of time. I'm not totally sure what that means. Maybe it doesn't actually mean anything, which would be fine, which would be okay by me. Because that's what I've been doing, living in here indefinitely. The tense operator has been set to present indefinite for, I don't know how long, some time now. And although I still pick up the occasional job from dispatch, they seem to come less frequently these days. And so when I'm not working, I like to wedge the gear shift in PI and just sort of cruise. My gums hurt. It's hard to focus. There must be some kind of internal time distortion effect in here. 
Because when I look at myself in the little mirror above my sink, what I see is my father's face, my face turning into his. I am beginning to feel how the man looked, especially how he looked on those nights he came home so tired he couldn't even make it through dinner without nodding off. Sitting there with his bowl of soup cooling in front of him, a rich pork and winter melon saturated broth that moment by moment was losing or giving up its tiny quantum of heat into the vast average temperature of the universe. Because I work in the time travel industry, everyone assumes I must be a scientist, which is sort of correct. I was studying for my master's in applied science fiction. I wanted to be a structural engineer like my father. And then the whole situation with my mom got worse. And with my dad missing, I had to do what made, what made sense. And then things got even worse. And this job came along, and I took it. Now I fix time machines for a living. To be more specific, I am a certified network technician for T-Class personal use chronogrammatical vehicles and an approved independent affiliate contractor for Time Warner Time, which owns and operates this universe <laughs> as a spatio-temporal structure and entertainment complex zoned for retail, commercial, and residential use. The job is pretty chill for the most part, although right this moment I'm not loving it because I think my tense operator might be breaking down. It's happening now, or maybe not. Maybe it was earlier today, or yesterday. Maybe it broke down a long time ago. Maybe that's the point. If it is broken and my transmission has been shifting randomly in and out of gears, then how would I ever know when it happened? Maybe I'm the one who broke it, trying to fool myself, thinking I could live like this, thinking I could stay out here forever. Thank you. Um, so I just want to check first. Everybody can hear us OK? Are there any issues? Uh, okay, so the, the general idea of this panel is to talk a little bit about science fiction, um, you know, in the context of, of uh, the big read for the Wayne, but I, I wanted to start a little bit by talking about science fiction more generally, um, and sort of the genre, and what it means to be part of the genre. So Anna and Charles, you both are published by what we usually call mainstream or literary imprints. Kathleen, you're obviously published by um, the, the larger science fiction imprint in the U.S. Uh, how do you guys see yourselves, how do you self-identify that? Do you see yourselves as science fiction writers, as mainstream writers? Is, there, is that a useful distinction in your thought process? No. <laughs> <laughs> to all of that question mark. Um, I think it's a useful conversation to have. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about the ways that science fiction and like literary fiction integrate and feed on one another. But I, I always sort of wish for it, like, Utopian day when there won't have to be such, I think, hard boundaries because I think it makes readers feel like they can't cross as easily, which is a big shame for them and for us. I, I think the genre is a, is a useful tool and I like what I can do with science fiction. When I started writing science fiction, I thought of it as a very edgy and intellectually challenging genre. And that is why I chose to write science fiction. And I, I still believe that. I'm teaching science fiction now, and, and I find that to be very true. But I'm, I'm like Anna. I, I understand that science fiction uh, needs to be marketed as science fiction because uh, it gives people a marker in bookstores. But I do think that um, there, there are definite markers for science, for science fiction that are, that are quite obvious when you, when you usually start reading it. And yet, it can be very, very subtle as well. So I like that flexibility of science fiction. But you find it useful as a, as a writing tool, as part of your process? And, but in, you agree with Hannah that it can be frustrating in terms of readers, or do you see it as useful for readers as well? I see it as useful for myself in that um, I feel as if I can do anything, mm -hmm. and there are things that one can do when one is not writing science fiction that are they're almost the same, but not not, not quite. There's there's a definite flavor about science fiction that that is is kind of exciting, actually. That's a really interesting point, Kathleen just made because that so you're sort of saying that it's uh, you you see it as opening up more possibilities to to be in the genre than that are not possible when you're not working with those markers, with, when people are expecting those markers, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, don't, I, th I think I don't, um, I don't think of myself as a science fiction writer. I think a lot of people don't either. And I think, uh, 
I mean, to my dismay. And I think it's, um, it, it's, it's interesting to think about a bookstore, um, the ones that are left, you know, not having any signs. Like, but now we have this other thing where you don't have bookstores, you have, if you like this book, you will like these other eight books. And that's better than a sign. And that's kind of like, that's like the ultimate sign, right? It's the, it's sort of like um, the readers, you know, sort of, um, sort of are, are making the classifications wherever they are and they're fluid. So um, I guess I have people that I would like to turn up in there. If you like this person, then you will like these people. And that lets people across genres. Yeah, yeah. People that kind of maybe sort of sit on the, on the border. I discovered that on Amazon, sometimes if you quit my book, another book you might like is China Miaville's The City and the City. And when I discovered that, I was totally happy for the rest of the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's an interesting idea of, of genre being defined by readers as sort of a ground up way. But if, if you had to sort of sit down and make a list of, you know, what why is it that you consider something science fiction or not science fiction? What is mainstream? Is, it, is, there, a, is there a line or a particular element or a particular voice that, that defines that or a goal? Well, I know that, that Margaret Atwood's definition is that science fiction has bug-eyed monsters and spaceships and, and screaming women being snatched by the, the bug-eyed monsters. In the, and actually, there are none of those in my story, but they're in, in, in my books or stories. But they're still um, they're still science fiction. Uh, sometimes I like to call them speculative fiction because I think that it fits that category as well. Um, but uh, yes, I think when when one starts reading a book of, of strongly defined science fiction that's not very subtle. There are immediate markers that, that put you in a different world, a different frame of mind, a different time and space, uh, in perhaps the mind of an alien or the, in the mind of the bug-eyed monster or, or whatever that um, that make you understand that you were completely new. And if the science fiction is good, it will be a completely realized and universal interesting depth and beautiful writing and I think that that's one thing that uh, a lot of people think that science fiction is perhaps not beautifully written but it often is. I think that's the biggest problem I have with the distinction um, between like the literary and science fiction is it sort of presupposes that science fiction will not be beautifully written which is again you know not true much of the time and kind of a sad way to separate things out. Um, I think. Okay. Well, you know, in some ways, there, there's a separate axis other than you know mainstream science fiction of literary versus commercial, and you have you know science fiction that ends up a little bit on the literary end, and I would suggest that your work falls cleanly to science fiction, but a little bit more on the literary end. Your work sits on the mainstream science fiction border, and you know I, I think there are ways, different ways to slice it up. Um, and I don't know where to start with that. Actually. So, anyways, uh, we're going to move on. <laughs> um, so, oh, well, I, I guess here is exactly what I was going to ask. So, do, is it possible to be both mainstream and science fiction? Does the, the presence of science fictional ideas automatically take you out of being able to talk to the, to the widest possible audience? Or, you know, because we have identified that in some ways it's a book selling aspect of it. You know, we, the genres arose because we began to sell books in bookstores to a certain audience, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I, th I think that if, if you're coming uh, to science fiction through character, that then of course there's common ground because uh, that's what a lot of mainstream readers read for. They read for character. They read for the events in the people's lives, the, the, the things that change them, and uh, perhaps if there's a little extra element thrown in that is uh, slightly science fictional, I don't know, maybe like the time traveler's wife or something like that. Just uh, a little bit of that is, is good for some people. And, and that's fine, because then they think it's, it's speculative fiction. And, um, and then when you get further into the more highly defined science fiction, then uh, you lose some of those readers, and then, then you gain other readers. So, uh, but I 
you know, I feel as if I, you know, I could write anything, and, and I do. For some reason, I, I just started writing science fiction before I really knew what it was. My father read science fiction. It was always around the house, and I thought, this, this must be the coolest thing ever. So when I started writing science fiction, I actually had to learn how to write it, and I embarked on this uh, quest to learn how to write science fiction. It's not what I grew up reading. So I, I guess one other thing that goes along with that is, is there's a sense of a number of people working the genre for many years. And you know, I think Charles, in particular your book, it can reference that sometimes, where there's, there are sort of familiar markers or familiar aspects. I mean, there's a man in a phone booth shaped box traveling through time and space. Um, was that important to you in some way it, about connecting with other science fiction uh, tropes or stories? Or um, I think the tropes did the work I, I, I needed them to do was to have really recognizable things to give this kind of broken universe a, a bit of atmosphere. So I was I was actually searching for the, some of the most recognizable and familiar things that would you know make it feel a little bit like there was you know furniture in this universe and it wasn't just um, and and I also needed to have even some real I guess real world in this world references to to fiction to fictional places because um, I think I wanted there to be a sort of a tangent point between Universe 31 and this universe and so the, the pop culture references were those tangent points where it would anchor it a little bit in terms of I'm not just reading about some um, little tiny bubble universe. It's supposed to have some kind of um, uh, some boundary, you know, crossover with this place. Yeah. It's interesting that you no, no. I was going to say, it's interesting that you talk about tangent points because I feel like there's um, increasingly more tangent points between literary and or mainstream fiction and science fiction, especially I'm thinking here of like, you know, sort of like high literary fiction by like prize winning novelists. Like, I remember feeling like it was a real watershed moment when in my Cunningham specimen days, there's lizard guys. Um, there's lizard guys in like the third section. After the first two sections, I guess the one of the first two sections is a little genre-y in a detective way, but you know he had already built this like really really solid reputation as a completely realist writer who was incredibly highly acclaimed, and the fact that he was allowed to put lizard guys in his novel really sort of like warmed my heart and made me kind of feel the way that you're talking, where science fiction opens things up and allows things like that. Do you have a sense of what you think is might be behind that? Why more literary people are are playing with science fiction tropes? Um, you know, you have people like Mr. Cronin writing vampire novels, you have, you know, lots of sort of science fiction fantasy elements coming into mainstream audiences. When people ask me that question, I always say it's because the world is ending. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think that's totally fair because I think people have always been saying that the world is ending and it didn't end this year. Um, it was supposed to end like the week before this came out and I was glad it didn't. Um, but I do think that, um, I do think that there's a kind of uh, acceptance of geekdom and sort of like cool factor of all the things that were like pretty geeky in the 80s and 90s. Um, and that, you know, and even this extends to apocalypses and extends to dystopias. Um, I mean, I remember being a kid and being completely obsessed with the apocalypse and with, you know, horrifying alternate realities. And I think that kids who are obsessed with those things. Um, have come of age and are now excited to see them and that they have come to expect them of, you know, wider and wider parts of culture as opposed to small microcultures. I'm, I think we're living in, it, people realize that we're increasingly living in what could be called a science fictional universe, that our, that our whole world is kind of invisibly crept into being the, the world that was portrayed in some futures, although I don't think that science fiction is predictive at all, but uh, on the other hand, a lot more people know a lot more about science, I think, than when I was growing up, because there are a lot of books now written by scientists for lay people like me. So you can, you can get some of the flavor of the excitement of science, and then you can just kind of spin off on those things. There could be a pocket universe next to us or something, who knows? <laughs> 